As a scientist, I'm often asked, what is a comet? What's the point in studying them? The simplest way to think of a comet is analogous to an asteroid. Asteroids and comets are the rubble, the building blocks left over from the formation of the solar system, which, due to interactions with the giant planets, were unable to form the planets in their own right. The main difference between the asteroids and the comets is their composition, and this is driven by their, their location, their distance from the Sun. The asteroids spend all of their lives near the Sun, within the orbit of Jupiter. As such, they're composed of silicate rocks and metals, things you'd expect to see where the temperatures are high. Conversely, on the other hand, comets spend almost all of their lives a long way from the Sun, where temperatures are cold. As such, they contain ices. Voila. There are two main reservoirs of bodies which can become the comets orbiting the Sun. The first and largest of these reservoirs is the Oort cloud, a spherical cloud of bodies orbiting the Sun many hundreds of billions of kilometers away. These bodies orbit the Sun every few million years on orbits which can loop almost as far as half the distance to the nearest star. The second reservoir is the Kuiper belt, which is a, a belt of bodies orbiting on a fairly low inclination just outside the orbit of Neptune. So these bodies typically orbit around 5 billion kilometers from the Sun. Every now and then, one of either of these populations of bodies will be kicked inwards towards the Sun onto long, looping elliptical orbits. A long way from the Sun, we see a bare nucleus, almost like an asteroid in space, a point source. As we approach the Sun, ices on the surface start to sublime. They turn straight from solid to gas. In doing so, they form the coma of the comet, a transitory atmosphere, a cloud around the nucleus. The nucleus here is a few kilometers wide. The coma may be many hundreds of thousands or maybe a million kilometers across. As the body approaches the sun, this coma is impacted by the solar wind and the solar radiation pressure, which forms the tail, which we associate with comets. The tail typically points away from the sun as the comet orbits. If we are lucky, we may have a great comet, a comet which is very large, many tens of kilometers across the nucleus, or which approaches the sun very close. In this case, we have two tails. We have, on this image, the blue iron tail, which points directly away from the sun, and the silver dust tail. The dust lags behind slightly as the comet orbits. The unique thing about comets is not just that they're the building blocks of the solar system. Their life history means that they are pristine. They are the ideal, ideal material to go and study if you want to look at the origins of the solar system and possibly even of life itself. As such, as a scientist, I really cannot wait to get to the comet to, to land, to sniff, to analyze, to see what these things are made of. There have, of course, been missions to comets before now. These missions have, however, all interacted with the comets at very high speed. They've flown past at many kilometers per second, or indeed impacted with the comet in the case of deep impact. Following the success of Giotto in 1986, however, the Europeans decided to do something a bit different. 
they decided to have a long duration encounter with the comet. They decided to build a space mission to enter orbit around the nucleus of a comet and to deposit a lander onto the surface. After many iterations, this mission became Rosetta. Rosetta is quite a complex mission. It comprises an orbiting spacecraft. This spacecraft will orbit the nucleus of a comet, producing a, a global map, doing some really, really cool science, trying to work out what the comet's made of from orbit. After six months, Rosetta will deposit a lander named Philae onto the surface. Philae will separate from the orbiter, will deploy a series of intricate landing legs, which will allow it to, to dock with the surface of the chosen comet. The comet chosen was churimov gerasimenko a comet discovered by a pair of Ukrainians back in 1969. It orbits between the orbit of Jupiter and the orbit of Mars. The, the nucleus is roughly four kilometers across. Uh, we cannot say precisely what shape this is, but the small size means it cannot form a sphere and its own gravity, so it's likely to be roughly potato-shaped. This here is a, a simplified Lego model representation of the lander, Philae, which we will use to demonstrate some aspects of the mission. Fixation is a very important issue on the comet surface as there is low gravity. As soon as two legs have contact to the comet surface, a harpoon gets shot, which you can see over here. This harpoon is taking a small wire with it, and as soon as the anchoring tip is fixed in the comet surface, the wire gets rewinded and the lander rests perfectly on the comet surface. In addition to this fixation, in the foot itself, there is a so-called eye screw, which uses the landing energy to screw into the surface and therefore is an additional fixation. On top of that, as all these means are not working at all, we can use our so-called code gas system, which is a kind of hold down thrust, means there is a thruster which can blow out a force to keep the lander on the comet surface until the damping mechanism of the landing gear is able to get quit of the descent velocity. The landing gear has a few more functionalities. There is a rotation mechanism. The overall body can be rotated around its axis to make measurements on different surface spots. It can lower and lift the complete lander down to the comet surface, and it can tilt as well the body of the lander so that the, the bottom plate of the lander is nicely parallel to the comet surface. 